Hello everyone, welcome to week 10. We are picking up with the second half of chapter seven, chemical bonding and molecular geometry. So last week we went over ionic and covalent bonding, Lewis structures and formal charges and resonance. This week we are going to build upon those sections and talk about the strengths of ionic and covalent bonds and molecular structure and polarity. These two sections are gonna be a lot of examples as it's not very easy to just kind of tell you how to do things. It's a lot easier to go through it. So bear with me and make sure you bring, come up with any questions you may have. So starting with 7.5, strengths of ionic and covalent bonds. We are going to be describing the energetics of covalent and ionic bond formation and breakage using the Born-Haber process to compute lattice energies for ionic compounds, and use average covalent bond energies to estimate enthalpies of reaction. So let's start by talking about covalent bond strength. So the strength of a covalent bond is measured by the energy that's required to break it. So the stronger the bond, the more energy. Okay, so uh, you can almost kind of think of this as like, a couple maybe who's been together a long time. It takes a lot more for them to split up than for instance, a high school couple for the high school freshman that just met and went to one dance together. Doesn't take that much to break them apart. Okay, so this bond energy or it's also called the bond dissociation energy is the energy required to break a specific covalent bond in one mole of gaseous molecules. And your book has some tables um, uh, table 7.2 and 7.3 that give you um, some average bond lengths and bond energies. So what we are demonstrating with these bond energies is we have some x, y, so we have these two, these atoms bonded together and we want to break them apart into gaseous X and gaseous Y, we have some delta H formation that is required to do that. So for example, hydrogen H2 separating into two hydrogen atoms needs 436 kilojoules to break it apart. Another example here is methane CH4. And to break it into carbon and four hydrogen atoms, it has an enthalpy of formation of 1,660 kilojoules. So this is its average bond energy. And this is, so this is the average energy to break all four of these carbon hydrogen bonds. So if, so on average then, it's about 415 kilojoules per mole per bond. But the energy really is not the same for each bond. It actually takes the most energy to break the first bond, and then it's easier to break the rest of them with time. So the first bond is actually the highest energy, and the other three then start going down in energy. Bond strength itself tends to decrease as we move down groups. So at, on our periodic table, okay, here's my crappy periodic table drawing, as we go down a group, that bond strength decreases. So for instance, fluorine bonds stronger to something like hydrogen than chlorine, than bromine, than iodine. And we can use these bond energies to calculate the approximate enthalpy changes for reactions where we might not have an enthalpy of formation immediately available. So if, you know, you're looking in Appendix G in your book for some enthalpies of formation and you don't see it for a specific molecule, you can use the bond energies for the different bonds that are present to get an approximate enthalpy change. Now, again, this is approximate. It's not going to be perfect, but it gets you a fairly decent ballpark number. And you can really tell us if the reaction is endothermic or exothermic based on the sign for delta H. Just a reminder, endothermic if delta H is, is positive, and exothermic if it's negative. And so what this is, is it's equal to the sum of the energy required to break all the bonds minus the sum of the energy released when those bonds form. 
and I, I put a little stipulation here. When we say minus that energy, we're saying it's plus the negative energy release. Because remember, re energy released is a negative sign. It's exothermic, so that's what we're saying here. Using the equation is an easier way to look at it. Okay, delta H is equal to the sum of the bonds broken minus the sum of the bonds formed. So let's look at an example. Looking at hydrogen and chlorine gases combining to form HCl, hydrogen chloride gas. And notice we're forming two hydrogen chlorides. Keep that in mind. So we have to break one mole of hydrogen hydrogen bonds and one mole of chlorine chlorine bonds. And those are going to form two moles of hydrogen chlorine bonds. So our delta H is equal to the sum of the bonds broken minus the sum of the bonds formed. So we look up the bond energies in our table and we see that for the hydrogen hydrogen bond it's 436 kilojoules per mole plus the sum for the chlorines is 243 minus, and we have to multiply the bond for the HCl by two because of the two moles made. So that's why there's a two in front of this. So minus two times 432, and we get negative 185 kilojoules. So this is a negative enthalpy, which means it's exothermic because energy is being released. And if you were to go to Appendix G, which has standard molar enthalpy, so it has those delta H formation standard, you would see that it is negative 92.307 kilojoules per mole for HCl. And since we have two moles, we multiply this times two moles, and we get negative 184.6 kilojoules. Very similar to 185. For, so using this um, estimation process, using the bond energies, we can get fairly close. So we have good agreement there. So we're going to go ahead and look at example 7.9 to calculate the approximate enthalpy change of methanol, uh, which is um, potential alternative fuel. Um, and we can make it by reacting carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas. So we want to use the bond energies in table 7.3 in the book to calculate the approximate enth enthalpy change for the given reaction. So the first thing you want to do when you have a problem like this is write the Lewis structures for your reactants and products. Because this way you can identify all the bonds you have. They do give you a little bit of a hint with the structure of methanol. When they put this CH3OH, what they're saying is this carbon has three hydrogens, and then this oxygen is attached to the carbon, and this hydrogen is attached to the oxygen, just like they drew it, drew it here. But if you're ever not sure, you can always type in the formula or the name and put, you know, Lewis structure after it, and you'll be able to find it. So again, we need all these Lewis structures so we can identify all the bonds that we need to break and form. And when we look at this, I have to break a carbon-oxygen triple bond and two hydrogen-hydrogen bonds. And I'm forming three carbon-hydrogen bonds, one carbon-oxygen bond, and one oxygen-hydrogen bond. So that's what this second delta H down here represents. So notice we have that two in front of the hydrogen-hydrogen bond and the three in front of the carbon-hydrogen since we have multiples of those bond types. So we're going to go ahead and look at table 7.3 to get our energy values. Put those in and put it in our calculator and we get negative 107 kilojoules. If we go to appendix G, we get delta H formation and we have to go ahead and do products minus reaction, minus reactants for this. So we have to look up a couple different delta H formations. And when you do this, you get negative 90.5 kilojoules. So they're somewhat close, but they're fairly different. 
And this is because these bond energies are the average of different bond strengths. So you need to keep that in mind. Um, the bond energies are not perfect. Again, they're averages of different bond strengths. So we get rough agreement. Okay, um, and then just a reminder, using the appendix G, delta H, this is delta H, F products, the sum of them minus the sum of delta H, F reactants. So there's carbon monoxide and there's the hydrogens and you have to multiply the hydrogens times two because you have two of them in your balanced reaction. Good old stoichiometry. You guys love it so much. Now we're gonna talk about ionic bond strength and lattice energy. So ionic compounds are stable due to electrostatic attraction between the positive and negative ions. So recall when we talked about their structures, they're these three-dimensional cr crystals or lattices where you have attraction in all directions from the ions and you have alternating positive and negative ions to give these 3D structures. And the formula is, their formula units, it doesn't represent a molecule. So lattice energy, delta H lattice, is the energy required to separate one mole of the solid ionic compound into its component gaseous ions. So taking some metal, which is what that M represents, metal X, so some ionic compound, and separating it into its positive uh, metal ion and its negative nonmetal or anion. And then you have some delta H lattice. This is, with this book, the way that they do it, since they're showing it as the compound breaking apart, it is being represented as an endothermic process because we're separating it into ions. There are some textbooks that show you the ions combining with an exothermic enthalpy. So remember, exothermic is a negative enthalpy. But the magnitude is the same. So... In our book, we're going to have a positive energy since it's endothermic. But if you're looking up values and you notice it gives a negative uh, energy, it's probably because it's representing it uh, where the ions are combining as an exothermic process. So keep that in mind. So for example, sodium chloride has a delta H lattice of 769 kilojoules per mole. And that means that you need 769 kilojoules to separate one mole of sodium chloride into gaseous sodium and chloride ions. We can also calculate delta H lattice. And the equation is given here, C, which is some constant, depending on your type of structure, times the charges, Z positive and Z negative on your ions divided by the interionic distance between them. And this is the sum of the radii of the positive and negative ions. So by looking at this, one thing you should hopefully see and start thinking about is as we get higher in our ion charges, so instead of having one and one, let's say we have positive two and negative two, we've already quadrupled our la delta H lattice. Okay, so as we increase our ion charges, we are increasing our lattice energy. And then as our ion, ion radius decreases, so as we're getting these higher charges, they're more attracted to each other. As that distance between the uh, radii decreases, then we're also increasing our delta H lattice. So they're a lot closer. Those positive and negative charges are interacting more, so it's going to take more and more energy to break them apart. For example, aluminum oxide, this is what makes ruby. The traces of chromium 3 plus is what gives it its color. Um, and then we also have aluminum selenide, and this is used for some semiconductors. So some somewhat similar compounds um, and we want to know what the, has the larger lattice energy, aluminum oxide or aluminum selenide. And 
what we should notice is in both of these we have aluminum three plus and oxygen and then we have oxygen two minus aluminum three plus and selenium two minus so our z plus and z minus are the same okay z plus is three for both of them and two for the negative so we're going to be depending on the radius the ro oxygen is higher on the periodic table than selenium. So it's al already a smaller atom than selenium. And then when you take off those elect or you give it um, electrons, while it does get bigger, it's still smaller than selenium. It has less orbitals, less shells, so smaller size. So it's going to have a shorter interionic distance. So smaller RO, which is a smaller denominator, means larger lattice energy. So aluminum oxide is going to have the larger lattice energy. This brings us to the Born-Haber cycle. And this is for calculating the lattice energy of an ionic compound. Because we cannot measure lattice energy. It would be great if we could, but unfortunately we cannot. And the Born-Haber cycle is going to use Hess's law. So remember Hess's law, it's a state function. It talks about how enthalpy is a state function. And hopefully you remember what a state function is. That means it doesn't matter how we get there, the value is the same. Doesn't matter if we take one step and jump to the top of the mountain or we take a whole year running in circles around the mountain to make it slower for us, the elevation at the top is still the same. So we use Hess's law then to break our solid formation into steps. So we have the delta HF, the standard enthalpy of formation, the ionization energy the electron of the metal, the electron affinity of our nonmetal, delta HS, the enthalpy of sublimation of the metal, the bond dissociation energy of the metal, and the lattice energy of the compound. And we can also, like let's say we know our lattice energy, but we don't know our bond dissociation energy. We can also calculate then that bond dissociation energy when we know everything else. Okay, so because all we do is we combine everything to get delta H lattice. Um, another little thing is that lattice energies tend to be higher than covalent bond energies, but we really can't directly compare them because the lattice is associated with many interactions. So you have all these different ions interacting with each other, whereas the covalent um, dissociation energy is talking about just two atoms breaking apart. So just to show you the Born-Haber cycle, um, starting here is our starting process, our starting point. My pen's acting up. There we go. So we see we first have delta HS, and then we go into ionization energy, to bond association, to electron affinity, and then down to forming our final product. Um, and this is an example. Um, looking at um, carbon and or cesium and fluorine, f forming cesium fluoride. So we first have to take cesium and make it into a gas. So that's what we're showing here with the delta HS. And then we have to use our ionization energy to make the cesium atoms into cesium cations. Um, and then from there, we have to look at the energy to break apart the fluorine into gaseous fluorine atoms. So we have to break that F2 apart. And then use our electron affinity to give that fluorine an electron. And now we finally have one mole of cesium cations and a mole of fluorine anions that can combine to make the cesium fluoride. So you can now see the cycle and how it goes. 
And the overall change is equal to our starting or ending point minus our starting point. This difference here, this delta H of formation, is equal to negative 553.5 kilojoules per mole. And if you were to take all the different um, all the different energies that we just calculated with all those steps, since the overall delta H or delta H formation is equal to the sum of everything, we get the same answer. So we have the same enthalpy of formation here. And the one thing that we don't know, we're going to assume we don't know this uh, lattice energy. So we're going to be using everything else that we know to calculate the lattice energy. But to start off, we know that delta H of formation is equal to delta H S plus one half D, and that's because of this one half in front of the F2, plus the ionization energy, plus the electron affinity, plus delta H lattice, negative delta H lattice. So solving for delta H lattice, we have that it is equal to negative delta H of formation plus delta H S plus one half D, plus our ionization energy, plus our electron affinity. And the reason that the delta H lattice is negative as well as the electron affinity of fluorine is because, looking back here, the electron affinity and the delta H lattice are going in the opposite direction. So they're coming down, whereas the other three are going up in the um, energy here. So. Going down, we're, for, we're now forming our products. So this is why the electron affinity is negative here. Also because it's exothermic. And then our lattice energy, again, it's a, we're forming products instead of breaking them apart. So we're taking the ions, putting them together. So this delta H lattice is negative. So plugging in all of our numbers, delta H lattice is going to equal 553.5, since it's a negative of this negative formation, plus 76.5, plus 79.4, we're just putting in all these numbers that are given to us, plus 375.7, plus 328.2, and that gets us a delta H lattice of 1,413.3 kilojoules per mole.